This lecture is about one of the most exciting issues in cosmology, the origin of the cosmic microwave background. And the title of the lecture is the following question. Is the cosmic microwave background a relic radiation of the Big Bang or thermal radiation of cosmic dust? And I will try to persuade you that even though the CMB as relic radiation is a well known and commonly accepted concept, Recent astronomical observations indicate that the CNB is rather thermal radiation of dust in the universe. I will start with a short history of theoretical predictions and observations of the CNB. The CNB is closely related to the Big Bang theory and identified with the so-called relic radiation. The existence of relic radiation as a radiation remaining from the hot Big Bang was firstly predicted by Alpha and Hermann in 1948, and the temperature of the radiation due to the adiabatic expansion of the universe was estimated to be about 5 Kelvin at the present epoch. The temperature of relic radiation was later re-estimated by other scientists such as Gamow, Zeldovich, Dick and others. A great step forward was done by Penzias and Wilson, who built the Dick radiometer and discovered strong microwave radiation coming from the universe from all directions. The temperature of the radiation was about 3 Kelvin. And immediately after this discovery, Dick and others proposed to interpret the CMB as black body radiation originated in the hot Big Bang. There was another discovery related to the CMB. In 1992, Smooth and Mather revealed small-scale temperature fluctuations in the CMB called the CMB anisotropies. Obviously, the CMB attracted attention of astronomers and physicists, and many experiments were devoted to a detailed study of the CMB. First, uh, we will discuss which kinds of light we observe from the universe. There are several peaks in the spectrum of the observed light of a various origin. The peaks are connected to the extragalactic background light and to the cosmic microwave background. At shorter wavelengths, uh, a cosmic X-ray background is also observed, which is produced by quasars. But its intensity is uh, quite low and it does not contribute to the energy budget a lot. The measurements of the EBL are scattered, so we show an interval of values together with their upper and lower limits. The EBL includes light from stars and radiation of uh, galactic dust. The starlight is at optical wavelengths, being characterized by temperatures ranging from 4 to 6,000 uh, Kelvin. The galactic dust radiation is at far infrared wavelengths and its temperature is uh, between 15 and 40 Kelvin. The temperature of the CMB is 2.7 Kelvin and as you can see the CMB dominates the whole spectrum. How do we know that the peak at the far infrared wavelengths is due to the thermal radiation of galactic dust? We have detailed maps of dust temperature in our galaxy and also in other nearby galaxies. For example, this picture shows an all-sky map of dust radiation in our galaxy provided by the Planck mission. The temperature varies from 15 to 27 Kelvin with the mean value of 20 Kelvin. The temperature depends mostly on the dust density and light emitted from nearby stars. On the other hand, the variation of the temperature of the CMB is quite small. The CMB temperature is stable and uniform and measured with an extremely high accuracy. This all-sky map provided by the WMAP experiment shows that the CMB temperature is apparently heterogeneous, but the fluctuations are in fact extremely tiny. The fluctuations are plus minus 70 microkelvin, and they are called anisotropies. 
Interestingly, the CMB displays also polarization anomalies. This is shown in this picture. The color indicates temperature fluctuations and the vector field shows the polarization of the CMB. The CMB is linearly polarized with two types of polarization, the so-called E modes and B modes. And as you can see from the picture, which shows just B modes, the polarization anomalies and the CMB temperature anisotropies are of the same extent and they mutually correlate. So it was a short introduction of the discovery of the CMB and of its basic properties and uh, we can now ask the question what is the origin of the CMB and I will present explanations provided by two rival theories Big Bang theory and dust theory. Let's start with the common concept of the CMB as a relic radiation of the Big Bang. I will summarize the concept of the CMB as relic radiation very shortly, because this theory is quite popular and well known, so just the basic facts only. The radiation was produced after the Big Bang at a redshift of about 1100 at the epoch called the last scattering surface which is the transition uh, between epochs of the opaque and transparent universe. The CMB temperature was about 3000 Kelvin and the photons decoupled from matter at this epoch. Due to the adiabatic expansion of the universe, the temperature of radiation decreased to the 3 Kelvin observed at present. The temperature anisotropies reflect some random density and velocity fluctuations at the last scattering surface epoch and the polarization anisotropies are assumed to be produced by the Thomson scattering in a heterogeneous plasma at that epoch. However, the theory is not fully consistent and satisfactory. There are some controversies, uh, difficulties and open questions related to this theory. Uh, for example, since the CMB anisotropies were produced by random fluctuations of temperature at the last scattering surface, they should have some statistical properties. And the detailed studies show that these properties are violated. For example, an unexpected non-Gaussianity of the CMB anisotropies was revealed and the violation of the statistical isotropy and scale invariance. Uh, there is also another point. It's quite strange that the CMB survived for so long time from redshift of 1100 to the present epoch without any distortion caused by absorption of light by galactic and intergalactic dust. The CMB spectrum and the total flux are measured very accurately and their distortion should be detected. For example, the figure shows a decline of the total CMB intensity for two models. Model A, which assumes that the proper density of dust in the universe is constant with redshift, and model B, which assumes that the proper density is proportional to the global stellar mass density of the universe. The figure indicates that dust in the present epoch with redshifts close to zero does not attenuate the CMB much. But the attenuation strongly increases with increasing redshift. The full lines show the distortion by intergalactic dust and by galaxies and the dashed lines show the distortion by galaxies only. And looking at the full lines, the total CMB intensity, which is 996 nanowatt per square meter and steradial should be declined due to attenuation by galactic and intergalactic dust in the redshift interval from 0 up to 10 by at least 1 nanowatt per square meter and steradial. And this value is well above the sensitivity of current CMB measurements. Of course, this questions the nature of the CMB as relic radiation.
Let us introduce the second explanation, the CMB as thermal radiation of intergalactic dust. This idea has been proposed a long time ago in relation with the so-called cold Big Bang theory and with the steady-state cosmology. However, it was not broadly accepted. So, what is the basic idea? Dust absorbs light of stars, it is thermalized and emits uh, thermal radiation. Galactic dust produces thermal radiation at far infrared wavelengths. The intergalactic dust is colder than galactic dust and it is assumed that it emits the CMB. This idea was proposed and discussed by many scientists a long time ago. However, this idea or hypothesis was not very much developed and immediately appeared arguments against this explanation, and difficulties and open questions. For example, why the CMB radiation is so uniform and isotropic, although dust distribution is very likely quite heterogeneous. Why the CMB is not affected by a variety of redshifts of radiating dust grains? We should observe a mix of differently redshifted spectra. The dust grains are present in the large range of redshifts, so we expect to observe the sum of many redshifted rest frame spectra radiated by dust, but not a spectrum of black body with a single temperature. Also, it is not clear what is the origin of the CMB polarization why dust radiation is polarized and why the CMB temperature and polarization fluctuations are spatially correlated. Probably the most important reason for rejecting this concept is the second point, why the CMB spectrum is not affected by redshifts of grains at the different distances from us. So this explanation was just an idea but not a consistent theory. There were no answers to these questions and this idea was abandoned a long time ago and not considered further. But was the idea really incorrect? Maybe we do not just understand the problem sufficiently deeply. Maybe we can manage the mentioned difficulties and find answers to those open questions. So let's look at this idea again and let's try to understand the role of dust in the universe. Let us summarize what we know about dust. First, we know that the universe is not transparent, but partially opaque. This is a fact supported by observations. The opacity of galaxies due to galactic dust is well known and illustrated on this figure, showing a dusty cloud using two different filters a more blue band filter on the left and a more red band filter on the right. The void in the left hand panel is not because of the absence of stars in these directions, but because of extinction of light of stars behind the dust cloud. The right hand plot demonstrates that light extinction by dust is wavelength dependent because the red color is not so attenuated as the blue color and some stars are visible at these wavelengths. So the original spectrum is distorted and the blue color is more suppressed and we speak about the reddening effect. Of course, where dust grains absorb light, they are warming up and emit thermal radiation. The galactic dust produces the EBL at far infrared wavelengths, but it is a question, how is it with the intergalactic dust? It should also produce thermal radiation and it seems that the CMB is a good candidate for that. A few words about dust itself and its properties. The dust grains have a size on the scale of micrometers. They are needle shaped or elongated or they can have a complex fluffy geometry. They are produced by supernovae collapses which outflow material into the space 
and they are formed by graphite, silicates and metals. The most important property of dust grains is their electrical conductivity and light absorption which is wavelength dependent. This is demonstrated on uh, this uh, figure which shows the so-called extinction law. Light extinction strongly decreases with increasing wavelengths. For example, light extinction at the CMB wavelengths is by at least four orders lower than that at the visual wavelengths. How is it with the amount of dust in the universe? Different types of galaxies contain a different amount of dust. The elliptical galaxies are almost dust-free and transparent, and the extinction for a ray passing the elliptical galaxy is only about 0.04 to 0.08 magnitude. The spirals and irregular galaxies are more dusty and the extinction is higher. Galaxies with a high star formation rate have the extinction even stronger. The mean value of the visual attenuation obtained by averaging over galaxy types and their occurrence is about 0.15 to 0.30 magnitude. As regards intergalactic opacity, it is produced by dust in the intergalactic medium, in a particular in damp Lyman absorbers. These absorbers are large clouds of gas and contain also dust grains. And these clouds can be found near galaxies in galactic halos and in the intercluster space. The intergalactic opacity studied by quasar composite spectra, which show a systematic variance with redshift. And the opacity is strongly redshift dependent. Nevertheless, the mean local value of visual intergalactic opacity is only 0.02 magnitude per gigaparsec, so the local universe is effectively transparent. But it is important that it does not mean that it is transparent also at higher shifts. Intergalactic dust extinction can also be estimated from amount of hydrogen in the damped Lyman absorbers, which as I said are dense clouds with hydrogen column densities of 10 to 21 per square centimeter, which are self-shielded against ionizing radiation and they are rich in dust. The Lyman absorbers are studied effectively from the Lyman alpha forest observed in quasar spectra. There are several empirical relations between the amount of hydrogen and the color excess due to dust. So finding a frequency of an occurrence of DLAs from the quasar spectra and considering their column density, we can estimate the intergalactic extinction and we obtain a more or less the same value as from studies of the composite spectra of quasars. That means about 0.02 magnitude per gigaparsec. Now we will focus on light in the dusty universe and how the universe opacity is evolved with redshift. Once we know that the universe is opaque, the crucial question is how opacity affects light observed in the universe. So let us focus on calculating the intensity of the EBL. When calculating the light intensity, we have to sum light from all galaxies at a given receiver. The spatial integral is then transformed into the integral over redshift. And the fundamental quantity in this integral is the redshift dependent luminosity density. This uh, dependence includes the change of wavelengths due to the expansion, the change of arrival rates of photons and the change of the angular size of uh, galaxies with redshift. The integral of course depends also on the expansion history uh, described by the Hubble constant and the Hubble parameter. Obviously, 
light attenuation should be considered in the integral and this term is usually ignored. The exponent in this term is the so-called optical depth, which is not, however, very simple because it is strongly dependent on redshift and on the expansion history of the universe. Why? Because the universe was smaller at high redshift, galaxies were closer each to the other, and the density of the intergalactic dust was higher. Hence, the optical depth was also higher. At the first sight, the opacity looks harmless in the local universe, but it becomes quite strong in the high redshift universe. So, since the local universe is effectively transparent, we have a tendency to believe that this must also be for the early universe, and this is a big mistake. As I mentioned, the universe occupied small volume at high redshift. This implies high dust density and high proper galaxy number density, and consequently also a strong dependence of the optical depth on redshift. This is documented in this figure. The optical depth is negligible at redshifts close to zero, but then it starts to strongly increase, uh, being one at redshift of about four, and still it further increases for increasing redshift. The figure shows the optical depth for a fixed wavelengths. However, we know that the wavelengths at high redshifts are shorter, and we have to take into account that attenuation is higher for high frequencies due to the extinction law. So the change of the frequency is another factor which causes that the universe opacity is really huge at high redshifts. Okay, we know that light is attenuated by galaxies and by intergalactic dust. And we can ask a question, which effect is more important, galactic or intergalactic opacity? And considering the spatial occurrence of galaxies, we can estimate the both effects and calculate their ratio called the opacity ratio. The formula for the opacity ratio is simple and depends on the intergalactic opacity, mean galactic opacity, and the galaxy mean free path. If we insert standard values for these quantities, we get for the opacity ratio a value of about 13.5. This means that the effect of intergalactic opacity is at least 10 times higher than that of opacity of galaxies. Once we have formulas for light absorption by dust, we can study the process of dust warming by absorbed light. Let us assume galaxies surrounded by dust. The galaxies produce light, which is absorbed by dust, and dust is warmed up. If thermal radiation of dust is kept in intergalactic dust, that means that no losses are assumed, then the dust temperature must continuously increase. In the Olbers paradox, we speak about the thermal catastrophe. But this is not a realistic model, because some energy radiated by dust is absorbed back by galaxies. However, a more realistic model is like this. Galaxies produce light, which is absorbed by dust. Dust is heated up and emits thermal radiation. The radiation is partly absorbed by dust itself, but partly back by galaxies. Hence, galaxies and intergalactic dust form a system which might be in energy equilibrium under a special condition that energy radiated by galaxies and energy absorbed back by galaxies in the form of thermal dust radiation equal. In this case, the dust temperature is stable and surprisingly, it can remain low as I will show on the next slide. So, how to calculate the temperature of intergalactic dust? We use the equation expressing energy balance between galaxies and dust. The right hand side is the intensity of the EBL, which is the energy radiated by galaxies into the dust. 
and the left hand side is a part of energy radiated by dust which is absorbed back by galaxies and the energy absorbed back by galaxies is only a small portion of the total energy radiated by dust because the majority of the energy is absorbed by dust itself a factor expressing how much energy is absorbed back by galaxies is uh, the opacity ratio so we get an equation between the intensity of thermal radiation and the intensity of the EBL and the equation says that the intensity of dust radiation should be the EBL multiplied by the opacity ratio when we insert values for the opacity ratio which is 13.5 and the measured intensity of the EBL which is 80 nanowatt per square meter and stir radian we get intensity of dust radiation and the temperature is calculated as the fourth root of this intensity and the value is 2.776 Kelvin which differs from the observed CMB temperature by an error less than 2% and that's an amazing accuracy hence we see that the total intensities uh, of the EBL and CMB in dust theory are not independent quantities they are closely related by a ratio between galactic and intergalactic opacities okay we are able to predict the CMB temperature very accurately but we have to solve the major puzzle of the story why the dust radiation is not affected by a range of redshifts of dust grains also we have to explain temperature and polarization and isotropies in the CMB the key is to know the evolution of dust temperature with redshift first let us briefly show how this is solved in the Big Bang Theory we have a volume filled with radiation and the volume is adiabatically expanding the process is described by the equation of radiative transfer and this equation is the differential equation and H in this equation is the Hubble parameter describing the expansion and solving this equation we get the intensity of relic radiation which increases as 1 plus Z24 uh, term 1 plus Z23 describes the spatial expansion and another 1 plus Z describes the increase of the intensity because of shortening of wavelengths due to redshift the temperature is the fourth root of the intensity so it depends linearly on redshift and now how is it solved with the opaque universe filled with the dust again we use the equation of radiative transfer but the right hand side now is not zero however dust is in energy equilibrium it absorbs energy radiated by galaxies but the same amount of energy is absorbed back by galaxies so sources and losses are in energy balance dust energy is constant and in this case the right hand side is again zero and the dust temperature is the same function of redshift as the temperature of relic radiation and does it solve our question why the radiation is not distorted by redshift yes of course because the increase of dust temperature with redshift exactly compensates the change of wavelengths if the radiating dust grain is for example at redshift 1 its temperature is twice higher than at uh, zero redshift and it radiates twice shorter wavelengths but on the other hand these wavelengths are extended before being observed at the present so we observe exactly the same wavelengths as from grains radiating at zero redshift but what we assumed in the dusty model we assumed that the universe contained the same amount of dust 
and the same number of galaxies independently of redshift. And this might be a problem. Maybe we identify the potential and crucial difficulty of that theory, because our experience says that the number of galaxies and the amount of dust in the universe is evolving with time. So it seems that the assumption violates observations. We observe almost no light from the early universe, supported by a decline of the measured luminosity density with redshift and a strong decline of the stellar mass density with redshift. This is the crucial point which apparently disfavors this theory. We have to solve this strong controversy. But is really this assumption controversial? Is it really so? Is the early universe really dark, meaning with no galaxies and no other light sources? Or the galaxies are there and we just do not see them because the early universe was highly opaque and light from galaxies is strongly attenuated. Let's look at both options explaining decreasing amount of observed light with increasing redshift. In fact, the both options seem to be consistent with observations. If the universe is transparent, no light means no galaxies. If the universe is opaque, no light means that we just do not see the galaxies because of the universe's opacity. And calculations indicate that the universe opacity might steeply increase with redshift, as shown in the figure with the optical depth. So we have to examine the opacity option quantitatively. It might happen, for example, that the observed decline is too fast to be explained by opacity of the early universe, or that the model of the opaque universe is completely incompatible with observations. So let's calculate the redshift dependent opacity and try to correct the observations for it. So let's assume that the universe is opaque and let's correct the observations for this universe opacity. We start with the correction of the luminosity density, which is an interesting evolution uh, with redshift. First, it increases up to redshifts of 3 to 4, and then it monotonously decreases as shown in the figure on the left. Different colors in the figure mean measurements of different authors. The correction of the measurements includes two factors which act against each other. A decrease of the universe volume with redshift, which causes that the luminosity density increases. This is because galaxies were closer each to the other in the past. And the other factor is the increase of the universe opacity with redshift, which produces, of course, a decline of the luminosity density. After correcting the luminosity density for the opacity and for the contraction of the universe, we get that the proper luminosity density is time independent, as shown in the figure on the right. So we see that dust theory is even capable to explain why the luminosity density is high in the range of redshifts between 2 and 4. This is because the universe is almost transparent for low redshifts and the luminosity density increases because of a decrease of the universe volume in the past. However, at redshifts higher than 3 to 4, the opacity becomes significant and its effect on the luminosity density is dominated. In the same way, we can call it the stellar mass for the opacity. The stellar mass monotonously increases with time, that means it decreases with redshift. But after correcting for the opacity, it becomes time independent. So it seems that no observation violates the assumption of that theory that the number of galaxies 
and the amount of dust in the universe is conserved. So galaxies are not missing at the early universe. We just do not see them. Finally, we should explain what is the nature of uh, temperature and polarization anisotropies of the CMB. And I will show that it is not very difficult and in fact the explanation is natural and confirmed by observations. To explain the origin of the CMB temperature and isotropy is quite simple. In dust theory, the CMB temperature and isotropy is caused by fluctuations of the EBL in the universe. The EBL in clusters has a higher intensity and the intergalactic dust is warmed up more than in voids or supervoids. And actually, recent observations confirm a correlation between the presence of voids and clusters and between the CMB fluctuations. So the CMB temperature and isotropy reflects inhomogeneities in the stellar density distribution. And a nice example is the so-called cold spot, which is a direction with an extremely low CMB temperature with a delta T of about minus 70 microkelvin. This fluctuation violates, for example, the statistical properties of the CMB anisotropies predicted by the Big Bang theory. However, the explanation under the dust theory is straightforward. The fluctuation is caused by the presence of supervoid observed in this direction. And since the EBL intensity in the supervoid is extremely low, the dust grains radiating the CMB are warmed up by the EBL to a low temperature only. And how is it with the polarization anisotropy of the CMB? And why the dust radiation is polarized? Again, the explanation is quite simple and experimentally confirmed for galactic dust. The polarization anisotropy is very likely due to interaction of dust with cosmic magnetic fields. The dust grains are conducting and elongated so they can be aligned according to the cosmic magnetic field around large scale structures in the universe. So they interact with the magnetic fields and can actually trace them. This phenomenon is well known for our galaxy. We know that galactic dust emits polarized light at far infrared wavelengths related to the magnetic field in the galaxy. This is nicely documented by these two images provided by the Planck mission, which show the polarization of galactic dust together with the color scale intensity of dust radiation. So a very analogous phenomenon might affect the polarization of the CMB. So let's summarize the basic conclusions of this lecture. As I have shown, dust theory provides a consistent explanation of the CMB origin. The CMB, according to this theory, is thermal radiation of intergalactic dust grains. And the temperature of the CMB is controlled by energy balance between galaxies and intergalactic dust. The CMB temperature is predicted with a high accuracy and it linearly increases uh, with redshift. The CMB temperature and isotropies are caused by fluctuations of the EBL, which are related to clusters and voids in the universe. The CMB polarization and isotropies are caused by alignment of conducting dust grains in magnetic fields in the universe. And the CMB temperature and polarization and isotropies are correlated because they have a common origin, the large scale structures in the universe. Obviously, thus theory has important cosmological consequences and it is fully incompatible with the Big Bang theory. 
since the universe opacity strongly increases with redshift, no light coming from the early universe is explained by high opacity of the early universe, rather than by its darkness. In addition, the theory claims that the corrected proper luminosity density is time independent, and also the corrected global stellar mass is time independent. The constant number of galaxies and the constant amount of dust in the universe are the key findings of the theory and point to a cyclic cosmological model rather than to an evolution of the universe from a singularity. As regards the Big Bang theory, it must be emphasized that the CMB is the only direct observation of the Big Bang. So, if the CMB is not relic radiation, the theory is fundamentally questioned. So, it is pretty conceivable that our current understanding of the evolution of the universe is completely wrong. And to refute this well-known figure showing an assumed evolution of the universe might look completely inappropriate because the Big Bang theory is a mainstream theory commonly accepted. But we can ask a question, has this theory really profound and firm grounds? And you know the statement, a lie repeated a thousand times becomes truth. The version for scientists could be like that. A speculation repeated a thousand times becomes a respected theory. I hope that you found the topic of the CMB exciting and full of open and interesting questions. So, thank you for your attention.